Morning uh, and uh, welcome to the um, second public evidence session of the Commission for Smart Government. Uh, in this evidence session, we're going to be looking at uh, international evidence of best practice, which is the second of our 12 work streams. And uh, as well as uh, a number of our commissioners who are here today for uh, this session, we're uh, very honoured to be joined by Sibyl English as our star guest witness, uh, all the way from uh, uh, New Zealand, uh, uh, who's joining us uh, late in the evening. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Sibyl. It's a great honour to have a former Prime Minister and uh, Finance Minister of uh, New Zealand to uh, uh, join us. And uh, also John Micklethwaite and Adrian Woolridge, uh, who are uh, the doyens of uh, uh, international evidence gatherers of uh, government effectiveness and whose latest book, The Wake Up Call, is a must read uh, insofar as it uh, looks at uh, the impact of the pandemic and what it's exposed in the uh, deficiencies of governments uh, around the world. And uh, we'll be turning uh, to them in the second part of this evidence session at around about uh, 10 a.m. But I hope that uh, everyone will free feel free to uh, join in uh, along the way. So thank you, everybody. Uh, and just to say that this evidence session is being uh, broadcast live now and recorded and we'll make it available uh, on our website uh, afterwards. And we aim to finish at uh, 11 a.m. So uh, I'm going to kick off with the first question without uh, 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 more ado uh, to Bill. Um, Bill, we, we watch um, the reforms of New Zealand with great interest uh, here. Um, I think not, not least since your uh, remarkable pioneering economic reforms in the in the 1980s. But there were after that, there were the interesting reforms to the machinery of government in the late 80s and the early 90s that established uh, independent uh, departments that were commissioned from the centre uh, and then held to account. Uh, and I know that, that that sort of structure endured for quite a while. And I just wonder whether you might sort of give us your your view of that and its success, its strengths and its weaknesses and, and the extent to which New Zealand has, has, has moved away from that now. Well, thank you very much. And thanks for the opportunity to uh, share some of these thoughts from the end of the world, keeping in mind uh, that we're humble Kiwis. We've got a small country with a um, single chamber of parliament. And in some ways we can do dangerously too much rather than the usual problem of not being able to get enough done. Uh, and back in the 80s, they did an awful lot on the back of uh, the, F, the first past the post electoral system, including state sector reforms, which I think uh, had bipartisan support um, for a long time in New Zealand, the original sort of state management idea, which you described before, uh, locked in a vertical accountability. So you knew where every dollar went. Uh, they brought in accrual accounting, I think the first in the world to do that in the public sector, uh, which created the concept of capital and investment uh, in the public sector. And that model, uh, and, and at the top of the model was a, uh, you know, a, a chief executive or permanent secretary and a minister, uh, in, a, in our case, in a, in a fairly collegial cabinet model, uh, but nevertheless with a fair bit of scope. And the strength of that, I think, was it was shown by uh, the passage at the time of the, what was called the Fiscal Responsibility Act. And it turned out that that way of organising government made, uh, made it possible to go through the, the most significant budget adjustment um, in a generation, as you as happened in the UK after 2019, uh, in a somewhat similar, um, somewhat similar um, episode. So uh, yes, it was seen to work. A couple of bits that didn't happen. One is they never really got round to talking about outputs other than in that awful public service language that covers everybody and means nothing. Uh, and never really got to the commissioning part of it uh, insofar as having a smart buyer of the services specifying what they wanted. Uh, that that, that uh, model has developed uh, quite significantly more in the UK uh, than it has in New Zealand. And also it didn't quite lead to the kind of competitiveness that I think the original architects expected that ministers would somehow go and buy 
policy or services from someone other than the department. Uh, ministers don't really have that capacity, uh, including especially in a small country. And it, it turns out that quite a bit of what the public sector does has you know, special characteristics of the public sector. Now, while it can track every dollar, the biggest single weakness is it had no idea what difference that dollar made. And uh, you know, 30 years on, I was a junior treasury official then helping implement the state sector changes. Um, and I've just had you know, 10 years, nine years as a finance minister uh, trying to improve it. Um, has it endured? I mean, it, the, 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 has the, the system has evolved slightly, hasn't it, from its, 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 its original shape? And that was my first sort of follow-up question. And the second was, um, did ministers not want to interfere when things changed, uh, you know, from the original um, commissioning uh, arrangements that they'd agreed with, from the original outcomes that they'd, they'd, they'd agreed uh, with the department? Surely ministers wouldn't just go quiet and let the department get on and, and deliver those if something politically uh, flared up that re required their attention. So how, how kind of practical was it? Well, of course, the, none of these models are, are as perfect as their proponents make them, and the operators of the models aren't perfect either. So yes, of course, ministers uh, tried to interfere. If I can think of um, different examples, you know, were the officials allowed to uh, make all the decisions about bus routes, school bus routes, according to some magic algorithm? And the answer was probably about 85 to 90% of the time, yes. But the other 10% took up an awful lot of heat and energy of politicians sort of trying to interfere without making the decisions. Um, in health, you know, where there's layers of, of uh, autonomy and independence, uh, one of my colleagues used to, you know, text the head of the ED departments to check their waiting times that day, uh, which was, you know, some sort of the opposite of the model. So then there's other been other variations, you know, purchase of provider splits that didn't survive, uh, policy operational splits, some of which survived, some of which didn't. Uh, what 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 I what I like about the New Zealand model was this kind of restlessness, right? Where they, instead of saying, well, this is the best thing that could possibly be, there's a, an element of self-criticism that means they've kept experimenting uh, in, you know, in, in sort of responsibly incremental ways. But I'd have to say that the result of all that is you've now got, in some of the revisionism that's gone on, uh, you know, about restoring the old public service and so on, has left us now, like Australia and to some extent the UK, with large monopoly large eternal monopolies that no one believes can change. And they're not even trying in any significant way. Uh, so in that, in that sense, the model, it sort of perfected that model, but actually for a, for a significant portion of the population, it doesn't work that well. I think that leads very, very naturally onto the, 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 se the second question, um, Suma. Thanks very much, uh, Bill. I'm sort of half, or not quite halfway between London and you. I'm in Calcutta, India. So uh, on on route at least. Um, so just want to really pick up actually the sort of period when National was in power from 2012 to 2017, part of which you were prime minister for towards the end of that period, and a number of interesting reforms came in uh, during that period. I mean there was a better public service push, um, trying to get more cross uh, functional working uh, going. We tried the same in the UK, as you know, um, a stronger corporate centre. And trying to get chief executives, I'm particularly interested in this, and I guess Michael Bichard as well as a former permanent secretary would also be interested in this, trying to get uh, assessments of um, chief executives, not just for their what their organisation did, but for a sort of a set of outcomes that go beyond their organisation. And that's always been a struggle in the UK too. There's also the social investment uh, push that you made to try and really focus on uh, causes, not just uh, symptoms on the wicked issues, I guess, um, particularly in also those performance improvement frameworks. What are a golden thread, a narrative between that really held all this together, uh, this set of initiatives? And also, to what extent do you think actually there was an improvement over that period? Uh, I saw that our own case study paper takes a sort of chow and lie approach, which says it's too early to tell. Um, but maybe, uh, maybe, you know, you actually think it isn't too early to tell and you, there is some, some lessons that we can learn from that. Over to you, Bill. Yeah. Okay, so uh, look, 
I thought quite a lot of it was successful. I can talk a bit about some of that. Uh, but one measure is a, a regular survey that our um, State Services Commission does. Um, and through a period of uh, austerity, when we turned around a 9% uh, of GDP deficit um, to a surplus for over four or five years, public satisfaction with public services went up about eight percentage points. So the public were getting what worked. Uh, and the reason for that was <coughs> the, the three things there you've mentioned, and I'll just go through them quickly. The, the performance improvement framework was one a framework where we started with um, a kind of more political and business view rather than state services view. Because if, if the public service tries to assess itself, it just it just theologizes itself into oblivion and paralysis, right? They, they try and measure, they try and look at 65 characteristics of what they all thought it was like when Beveridge first set it up and, it's, and it doesn't really take anywhere. So the PFI model was a, an ongoing performance improvement framework. It had a mixture of experienced public services and outside people. And it was a very engaged, practical way of dealing with the senior management of a department about how they were running themselves. And it was always successful, right? It always flushed out issues. It always reset direction. And none of this was high profile or public or fought out in cabinet committees. And, and it was cabinet. It was, it was the public service doing it to itself. So that, that's a model. And the, the guy who sort of put it all together um, did a fantastic job. And it was sort of the un, an unsung success. It's really important you don't sit out on expenditure reviews because everyone know what that means. Um, or restructuring, because that's a waste of time. Almost certainly these days in public services, you get nothing out of restructuring. Um, but you focus on the performance of half a dozen people who run a large entity and how that, how that, how that all fits together, then it works. Um, the second thing was that, that I think really drove public satisfaction was the example I met, I, I said before, you know, targets are nothing new. Everyone's tried targets. Uh, what, what, it's, but it's just like in the private sector, everyone tries to make money, but a whole lot of people don't, right? It sort of looks obvious when it happens, but it's hard to help to create it. And the circumstances of the targets, which we picked 12, I think, and eight of them were pretty tough social targets, like reducing the number of substantiated child abuse cases, right? That's pretty hard to do. It's pretty hard to get public servants to own up to the fact that it goes on on their watch and they haven't, you know, they're not doing the best they can to stop it. Um, and that there was, a, there was a set of elements around the targets that mattered. One was they were published regularly. Second, they had direct personal accountability, right? That is a person in charge of a target. Uh, that, that really mattered. And I think the third one was just they were sort of un, unambiguous goods who could possibly not want to reduce the number of substantiated cases of child abuse or another one in our case was um, rheumatic fever. Um, and just, just as an indication of the effectiveness of them, rheumatic fever it's a, it is, you know, we shouldn't have it third, as a third world disease, but it's rife and it, it was pretty widespread in the Pacific population. The, the system had spent years hand-wringing and complaining about how it was a feature of the oppressive effects of capitalism uh, and actually over four or five years with a bit of focus and um, quite a bit of money we got the rate down by about 40 percent right on a scale no one imagined possible uh, and so what was a strong point of that whole period is the particularity and I can't emphasize this point too much if you want to change anything in the public service they have to have a good reason right because they don't have to they don't have to do a damn thing there's no existential threat from a competitor uh, like you find, and I'm finding in my own businesses in the private sector now. Uh, and so what motivates them? Well, what motivates them is what happens to real people. And this is where I'll introduce a word that um, it, it has disappeared again from the public service in New Zealand, but I held on to it for a while because I was senior enough to do it. And that's the word customer. You know, what actually happens with a young child who comes from a social housing into the A&E department with bronchial problems and has to wait six hours, and his mother's got to go off to a shift job, and so his big brother comes in, and then they get some kind of treatment thing that happens, and then they go back to their social house that's that's cold and got mould. Right now, that's what should drive your policy, not some 
not some theory about um, you know public sector institutions or institutional economics. Those are all tools that matter, uh, but these organisations have lost sight of what they're for. And so we did this thing we call it the Mason Curve, where New Zealand's got the best linked public service data in the in the world. Um, we can look at anonymised data of public service use of every citizen, some of it going back 30 years. And if you rank everybody by their public service use, the first 85% use half of all public services. They're the 85% reasonably well served by monopoly commodity supplied services, right? Standard, bog standard schools, hospitals. The problem is that the other 15% use the other half of all public service. So the need curve is logarithmic. Um, and the models are all built around normal distribution. And so you really need to understand those customers because those people are your big users, frequent flyers. They get small bits of commodity service that aren't that don't work and they exhaust themselves going around looking for it. So we spend a lot of time seeing what happens to real people. And if you put those stories and sometimes those people in front of the those who run your big agencies, it can't help but affect them, right? And I'd say to them, okay, we're make, doing mental health. Well, just imagine there's a 23-year-old schizophrenic Polynesian white young woman on drugs sitting in this room while we make policy about what we're going to do for her. And it, you know, it's, it takes their minds off fighting with the other departments and which minister said what to who and you know, and you know, we, we've got hundred thousand dollar jobs and suits, and all we've got to do is shift a bit of bloody money around. You know, this person's on the edge of living life and death, and if we screw up the service, she might end up dead. You know, she's living on she's living on a knife edge, and we expect her to look after herself. You know, and you guys can't even shift the money around the budget, so that particularity matters. So any policy, um, including with regulators, actually, first question is. Which people where, right? And I just banned use of averages, ethnic classifications, um, uh, sort of uh, you know all the socioeconomic um, indicators because it, you know young you know out of control teenagers tells you nothing. Which ones in which place? Because nothing's going to change unless you focus in that degree of particularity. And the public service is brilliant at turning everything into statistics and averages, because then you can't quite tell what happened. So that's the core of the social investment idea. Uh, and the other part of it is the longitudinal picture. So literally we calculated net present values of the, the return on investment of an institute, of, of return on investment for a person or cohort. So the key elements are a population, looking at a population, not at departments, Right, because departments can never tell you about a real person. They can only tell you about a pupil, a student, a prisoner. They can't tell you about a family that's got all three of those in it, right? Because they're not interested in the other ones. They don't care. They, you know, they, they, they want to know about the feedstock for their institutions. They don't, they're not, they're not driven by the family. So you've got to isolate a population, get clear about a population, and I can give you all sorts of anecdotes about that. Uh, and then relentlessly focus on them, and then you can calculate. So for instance, we did a thing with solo parents under 20. It turned out it was worth every sole parent under 20 in New Zealand having been individually supervised, right, individually. And so we made them go through all 4,600. Right, it's only two, big, only two big secondary schools. But their kids are the most, you know, the most vulnerable people in our community. Suma, did you want to? Yeah, that, no, I, find, I think the, the two very interesting points come out of that. Lots of lots of points, but I think two particularly for me are the particular particularity and the use of data and evidence really to drive down the question um, uh, that needs to be answered. The thing that I still want to just get Bill to talk a little bit about is, I guess, to what extent chief executives were resistant to the idea of being measured uh, for things that they weren't directly financially accountable uh -huh. for. Um, because this has been the bugbear of, in our system of trying to get measure success and make people take, 
take um, you know, yeah. take responsibility for things that they don't directly control, but are also important to delivering, um, okay. both so, at ministerial and at the first level. Yes, well, and you do have to get pretty robust about this. So you, you can imagine the scenario, all of those of you are public servants, where officials come in and talk to ministers with a grand plan to spend another, you know, 50 million pound fixing some problem in the world. And it's a reasonably convincing case as long as you don't look at it too hard, but you know, they, they believe in it. And so what I found was that when they want more money, um, they have great belief in their cosmic powers to change the world. And particularly when those amounts of money are large. Uh, but when you say, okay, well, you are going to be held accountable for actually achieving that for those actual people, Right? And you can, and this is a critical point, you can know who, because the data and technology is now so cheap, you can, know, you can know anyone anywhere, anyone can know anything anywhere now for nothing, right? even in the public service. So, and then as soon as you say, well, uh, you, you're going to be held accountable, they go, oh, no, 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 there's wider economic influences and there's other agencies and there's this problem with the, the community they live in. And then to which the answer is, okay, well, if that's the case and you're going to fail, why don't we just fail cheaply? So we'll give you 10% of what you're bidding for because you now you know already you're going to fail. You've just explained to me why I can't hold you accountable for getting anything to happen. So here's your 10%. Now I'm going to go off and find someone who actually believes. This is your, you've got to remember this. Your whole cohort of public servants is trained in hopelessness. Right? They, they are embedded, they are deeply penetrated with social determinism. Like So in New Zealand, the version of it is if you're poor and you're brown, you're stuck. Right? In the UK, it'll have a you know, different terminology. So most of them don't believe they can change anything, but man, they believe in the institutions that don't change anything. Right? And in fact, it goes further, because we used to have these debates. They'd say, you'd end up in this stupid logic that said, so those people right at the margin of the system, you know, your 10%, 5% high risk, they have to put up with crap service, you know, waiting, for, waiting a long time for under, under uh, low intensity service that doesn't work because that's how we maintain the social contract. That we have, that, that, that they have to pay the price so we can have solidarity around universalism. Yeah, that, well, that doesn't make a lot of sense to me. That we make some six-year-old kid in state care wait months for a simple medical procedure so the rest of us can feel good about solidarity. I mean, I just used to get angrier and angrier about this stuff. But that's what most, that's why you can't change the place because they don't think they can actually change much about real people. They don't see real people. The, the top 80% of your institutions never see real people. Uh, they have no idea what the service, how the service actually works. They've got a view about what they think the intention is, but of course, intention isn't quite enough. Uh, and they don't believe, even if they've got into that sort of messy, difficult world of these ungrateful people um, and suspicious people, they, they don't think they can make much difference, really, even if they get another few hundred million pounds. So, sorry, it's a long answer to your question, but it was a very good question. Thank you, uh, Bill. Uh, there's, uh, there's a lot in that, um, and uh, 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 some good provocations uh, there, there as well. Sumer, I remember you and I having to uh, deal with uh, uh, our frequent flyers, who were the, the recidivists in the uh, in, in the justice system, and having very much these sorts of um, uh, yeah. discussions. Sadly, it's what Bill said brought it all back. Uh, <laughs> <to the front laughs> yeah. of the well, just here's, here's a justice example. We looked through our data and found. Um, a cohort of 14 to 17 year olds with the distinguishing characteristic was they had five contacts with the police. They were our hard end. Now, if you want to empty a room of officials, you just say, okay, we found the hardest cases. Um, who wants to be responsible for reducing the, either the number or the, and we, we can assess the NPV of the cohort, right? We go, these people are going to cost us, you know, 128 million bucks in the next 10 years. Who wants to try and get that down to 100? Well, the room just depends. Because they yeah. don't, these kids, 
don't have real have addresses, they don't go to school, they're not really sick, um, they do know the police pretty well, and they don't qualify for any welfare. So no one's interested in them, and they wreak havoc. And you don't have to be a rocket scientist to see that. But I can tell you, we, we, even though we had a good functional justice sector, we didn't quite get to that one. Okay, we mustn't trespass into policy design because uh, which, uh, this is an incredibly interesting dis discussion. We'll, we'll, we'll stick to the sort of machinery uh, and uh, move now to, to Ian. Bill, um, maybe just one little supplementary on your last point, which was fantastic, um, which you're interested to know when you made these uh, objectors personal, how did you cope with the churn, rate of churn in the, in the civil service that, that we see in the UK? Because personal targets you know, and people only lasting 18 months in a role, 12 months maybe, it seems to be a sort of disconnect. But the, the substantial question I just wanted to ask was to get your view on the current uh, government's approach to wellbeing budgets and just what you've seen works there. Is there anything that you think is, is good, bad or ugly that we can learn from, um, certainly for when we think about the UK? Well, that, those two questions are connected. Uh, what we found is, the, the business of, of the personal accountability, of course, it could, it's, of course, it, you know, in an institutional setting, it's not quite the same as in your home, right? That's true, but it did raise just the issue you've raised. One of the things your institutions and ours have been very poor at is that on the one hand, we argue that they have to be permanent apolitical institutions. On the other hand, they're incapable of maintaining a trusted relationship with anyone who's vaguely got a vaguely complicated life, right? They can do it with my kids who truck up to school every day, but you know, if the child disappears from school, their education system's lost them. In a day, they're gone in one day, right? And I used to keep asking this question, okay, so who has a trusted relationship with these people? Which people wear? Who has a trusted relationship? And how are you gonna maintain that? And the truth is our public services cannot produce the institutional arrangements that enable longitudinal relationships of the sort that will help you deal with chronic problems. And so we went outside, went outside the public service to develop different models to do that. And that's been, um, that's been somewhat successful. Uh, and that's the problem with well-being. So well-being is a rhetorical um, reform, not a real one. Uh, so the initial impulse for well-being was part, partly a bit of intellectual work by a few people in the incoming government, um, but also because they didn't like numbers, right? So the current government, if it represents anybody strongly, it is the providers of monopoly universal services. That's its core constituency. So it stamps out anything that's not doesn't fit that sort of core post-war welfare state model. Uh, and so numbers are not part of that currency. So what happened was they, the first things they did before the wellbeing budget was get rid of all the particularity. So they dumped the targets, they dumped the investment calculations, they dumped the accountabilities, they dumped the publishing. And then they came, then they came in with, a, um, with a, a, a quite elegant rhetoric, but completely ineffective for the customers. It was great for the media and not bad for international profile, but but hopeless for people who, who suddenly found that no one was cared, no one cared about waiting times in, in, the, in the hospitals. People started dying because they weren't getting looked after. Uh, well, vaccination rates that had gone up to record levels, including among our most disadvantaged populations, started dropping like within six months. And now it's going to be a big issue with COVID vaccination because uh, the, the system that was there to deliver has deteriorated, um, even rheumatic fever went back up. So well-being is a rhetorical position. Now there's aspects of it that, yeah, so what happens is the public service just relabels everything, right? Cause it's, an, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's people looking up the system to reclassify into well-being, which is the opposite of what we were doing, which is looking down the system to find the customers and work out how to organize around them which is actually much harder. That's really hard because it's about changing us. Uh, and so well-being, I think, is reinforcing because it's, got all, it's, it's gone all vague and self-regarding. So it's now the spirit of service and the well-being budget. You don't hear anything about 
you know, 14 year olds who are going off the rails. Uh, it's now, it's, it's, it's reinforced the, the way that the agencies are part of the pathology of deprivation, right? So for your bottom 15% of the people, the monopoly universal provider is part of the pathology of their life because it keeps inviting them, sort of offering hope and then crashing it. <laughs> you know, and, the, and if you've got a disabled child, you do have to actually go and see 14 agencies to try and get your housing and your disability thing sorted. Well, you try it on public transport and 150 pound a week and trying to, trying to hold down 20 hours at the rest home. I mean, it's, it's, not, it's not pretty. And that's, so wellbeing has not penetrated the, the actual need. It's a kind of, you know, washed over a bit of middle class, a middle class interest in social justice. Um, and look, you're asking the wrong person. Anyone else in New Zealand would probably be slightly more positive about it than me. But, but uh, right, because I'd seen the thing before. Yeah. And a whole lot of people weren't, weren't you know, what we were doing before was a bit, um, you know, in the machine rather than high profile politics. So look, yeah. there's, there's some of it has proven to be useful, particularly around mental health, but by and large, it's a step backwards. Uh, that's really helpful. Maybe just one supplementary, but going back to your 15% and getting the real customer, which I still find surprising how difficult it is to get into normal boardrooms and businesses. The machine drives you away from customer really quickly. Um, but the thing I'm interested in, did you have any view on, you know, there have been various initiatives over the years, like, there's like Trouble Families, for example, where we're saying, if we can just fix these 120,000 families, then we, then we get this massive win. And, and a sense of why why various attempts around the world haven't worked, don't seem frankly seem to have worked. And I was involved yeah. with DWP for quite some time and couldn't understand why we couldn't literally nail these people down. Yeah. Well, you you've got just the right question. I mean, what's what is surprising about that kind of so, any social phenomena is when you look at um, you know, sp spatial economics of cities. What's surprising is how predictable these phenomena are, right? It's like all good big data. Really good big data gives you really simple answers. And the simple answer is, in this suburb, there are going to be 463 juvenile delinquents, and they're going to turn up on the 1st of February, and they're going to leave the suburb by the end of next year and they're going to commit this many burglaries and they're going to beat up this many old men. Uh, it's, this is the, this is, there's no mystery in this. It's not an overwhelming tide of need. It is totally predictable phenomena. And the way to execute the shared understanding, which is let's deal with it sooner, is just what you've said, basically one by one, okay? You know, I'm, I'm on the board of a large retail, the largest retailer in Australasia. And they go to an awful lot of trouble to sell one person a T-shirt. You'd be amazed. You know, and we can't go to that trouble to make sure one family gets some serious medical treatment that might save a life. We just can't be bothered. We've got this great big machinery. It costs us billions. It's 20% of GDP, but we can't bring us. So that, that's why I go on about the customer. That's the only way to do it. They're highly predictable phenomena. The data can paint that picture because it's not the numbers, it's the stories that are persuasive. And the problem is just our institutions were never designed to do that, right? They were designed to be a sort of a supplement to parishes and families and things. And so you've got to change your model to, and we've done, we've got the single whanau aura, which is a good example as I've seen it, um, which it's Māori for health, uh, family health, uh, and it's 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 particular to your family, and it's trust based, and it's long term, right? So if you can do that for 457 families in the right suburb in Birmingham, you're going to make a big difference. And in fact, the in social investment calculations will show you that is a big payoff. I think uh, this leads very uh, neatly to uh, the next um, set of questions, and Hussein. Uh, you're going to lead on those. 
Terrific. And it's really good to be on. You mentioned the affordability of technology and data and, and that now enabling um, the tracking of specific individuals to see the impact. Are there any examples where that was deployed effectively? So that back to the point around longitudinal studies and being able to see impact on an individual level, technology and data being used to, to make it appear as such. Uh, yes. Um, so our whole welfare system has been recast that way. So we calculate a bottom-up liability uh, and the relevant agency has 600 million of free cash flow a year to deal with a 70, 70 what will now be about an 80, 85 billion liability. And what it, show, it showed in vivid technicolor, the, you know, the, the uh, heterogeneity of the group, right? So this is a thousand people who need 1% solutions. Not, 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 not a thousand people who, for which there's one solution. And of course, the agency's not organized like that. So it showed the gap between what's actually needed to, and, um, and the best example that did it, that worked really impressively was the sole parents under 20, where over four or five years, for reasons we still don't understand, the number of them dropped by 40%. Okay. And, that's, and that's a huge social gain, right? Um, the uh, and, and there's other examples about particular groups in the justice sector. Actually, we got the most ministerial coherence there, and um, they had some real, you know, real impact on recidivism. But, but of course, as you do the easy, but easy ones, the, they get harder. So you get good progress, and then it slows down, and then everyone's got to get remotivated because they start realizing this is a lot harder than just saying prevention. Um, now, the the cost of doing this is dropping. I mean, it's just the same as the, the digital impact, the, 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 dig, the digitalization and technology that crushes transaction costs. I run a small business now with my family that is producing uh, social return on investment measurement. Uh, and we've got, you know, half a dozen smart young people and we can have a better evidence library and way better measurement, which we sell to NGOs like organizations with five staff way better than anyone in government's got, right? So and it's not because we're brilliant, it's just because they, the, they don't use the tools. And others, it's the same tools that, you know, help you run global supply chains, can help you figure out um, how, to, how to do a better job out in the suburbs. So it's, 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 it's doable, and that's what I find frustrating. It's, it's so cheap and easy now <laughs> to know this stuff. You know, knowing about it used to be a, professionalized, institutionalized, specialized function. You had to have statisticians and you had to have policy analysts and all that sort of stuff. You know, and we got a bunch of bloody 23 year olds here who can sit, who can, and, you know, in an hour give you the best evidence in the world about a whole range of interventions and um, then show you the return on investment for three or four of them that we've actually executed. And, you know, in another 12 months, we would have done dozens more. Thank you. Thanks. Thank, thanks very much. Um, there's a there's there's a related uh, reform uh, that, that I think we're quite interested to uh, to talk about that Mark uh, Rowley wants to ask you about, uh, Bill. Hi there. <coughs> Hi there, Bill. Good um, well, good morning from here. Anyway, whatever time of the day it is there. Um, you talked about sort of that brutal accountability um, model, which. Um, as an ex sort of senior cop, frankly, appeals to me, and a sort of uh, it was really interesting to hear it. As I understand at the moment, the current New Zealand government is sort of doing some reforms to try and take accountability more cross departmental. Um, I'd be interested in your view on that, and whether is that adding sophistication to that accountability, so you're getting a more joined up delivery, or is it sort of confusing and graying it and losing losing bites oh no i think it's it, what, what they're doing is actually quite good um and i think it's good because it was my idea <laughs> <laughs> that's not the only reason the other reason is because it's actually a good idea uh so I'll just talk a little bit about you know collaboration and siloizing because if i see another analysis of a public sector that says the problem silos um yeah i think i'll start a factory for explosives that blow them up and give the explosives away because uh, it calls it silos they're designed as silos it's not a mystery how come people discovered this this is what we built we built the damn thing this way 
for a different sort of accountability. So we shouldn't be surprised that, you know, you design an elephant that's going to look like an elephant. Um, so, so the standard response is, well, let's put all the elephants in a room together, right? And, <clears throat> and get them to work with each other. Well, in the first place, um, if, they not, if they don't have a common sense of purpose about a population, that won't work. So collaborate, 5% of collaboration works, uh, which proves and helps you understand why the other 95% fail. And they fail because they, they don't have a strong common sense of purpose. Also, this cross agency stuff fails for very simple reasons like, it, like there's six people in the room and they all have different operational and financial accountabilities and none of them match. So someone's got authority for 15 million, someone's got authority for 5 million. The other person is filling in for the person who's away on a conference, um, who's the assistant regional manager and actually has no authority. And they wonder why after 10 meetings, they haven't agreed on anything. It's because they've got no authority to do it. And they haven't tried to understand their own system. And the people who run your large agencies do not understand them. They do not understand the trail of financial and operational accountability that leads to decisions. They understand the minister's office and the cabinet office, um, and they understand their, their, their competitors, who are the other people trying to get into those offices and get money, but um, you have to go a long way down before you get someone who understands. So that's why collaboration doesn't work. So you can, sometimes if you get good leadership, enough money and a very strong sense of purpose, and we got that in our justice sector, um, except for the judges who, you know, are very special people who, who um, run a shambles of a system, particularly in the district court. It's no wonder young people don't respect it. Uh, well, they don't. They turn up and, you know, the lawyers didn't turn up and the file's not there. And you're saying to some 16-year-old, you know, show some self-respect. And he's going to say, well, why don't you just turn up? I did. Um, and, you know, don't get me on about that. <laughs> anyway, so the justice sector got good coll good collaboration. So the, the things you're talking about in the legislation were in, attempts are uh, to expand the toolkit with internal subsidiaries. So you think, what this is actually an internal governance problem, right? How do you get authoritative decision-making across a range of agencies? Well, how do you do it out in the market? You form a joint stock company, right? You turn up with your share of resource and your vote matches that and you have influence relative to what you invested. Uh, and so that's the, 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 what they've come up with is a sort of a, is a, a, a more acceptable language for internal subsidiaries where you have some prescribed governance processes. And actually, I think it'll work if people will let it, let it run. And they're trying it here with family violence, uh, which desperately needs something like that. And I hope it works. It's got some pretty committed, clever people doing it. But it could be used for a whole lot of you know, it could be used for my 2,000 um, uh, recidivist delinquent, you know, um, young delinquents. You know, they, they, need, they, they need a bit of special care, those people, and they need someone doing it who's accountable over time. Because that's the other thing about the sustained relationship. Agencies can't sustain a relationship with each other unless a, pol unless a number of politicians um, bully them into it and make them stay in the room. All the forces of our public sector are centripetal, just drive those things apart. So you want to lock in a statutory entity that holds them together for the life of the project. And so and let's see if it works. And presumably you've got the same issues. I mean, the, the challenge in, sort of in that say criminal justice scenario, if, if the view is actually we want to move resource from prevention to enforcement or from enforcement to prevention, it doesn't really matter, then um, historically agencies fight to protect their piece of that so how, is it building enough power in a system to be able to bang heads together and sort of and and referee that dispute uh yeah well you have to I mean, as you know and this is a complex adaptive system so you need multiple you need you need a whole lot of you don't just need one conflagration you need bushfires everywhere right um and someone asked right at the start you know is there a thread through these reforms well Often there wasn't. It was just let's start another bushfire somewhere. But if you take that collaboration, they if you can get them to to um, accept that there is a source of truth about the 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 
about life for their customers, you'd be amazed how motivating that is. So we did this fantastic thing called the Justice Pipeline, which was analyzing everyone who got, just mapping out the demo, the, the sort of what happens to people who come in contact with the police. Yeah. And it was brilliant because it showed that problems we thought were big were actually small. Problems we thought were small were actually big. Um, the biggest single problem was remand was a shambles. And there's a high correlation between that weeks on remand increase every week increases your recidivism likelihood by two percent something like that uh and that's what held them together because they had a truth right they had a journey they had some stories they had they had people they could keep coming back to uh to to, to overcome those institutional barriers so the great thing about data about um the clever use of data is you can show those stories Right, that's what it that's what it does. And, and and then you can then you count, of course. You say, right, well, we've this is a great program, blah, blah, blah. We put 300 people through it and it worked. And then you have to say, well, <laughs> there's 9,700 of them out there. Yeah. So how are we going to deal with how, how are we going to scale up? Uh, so it can be done. And we had some good examples of it. That's but you need the combination. You need the combination. And, and this is where we had the this a thing called the social investment agency. You know, you do need internally an agency that has the protection and the power to focus on actual populations, right? Independent of the main agencies. And you have to really believe in that because the big agencies will spend their whole time trying to suffocate them because they tell a truth that's inconvenient. Right? The more holistic view you have of a family or a community, the more it's obvious that any agency is not designed to deal with that need. It's designed to deal with a part of it. And therefore, they'll, it, it, to get change, they'll either have to work with someone else or change their model. And neither of those are things that they like much. And their ministers generally don't like that much either because they're hard. Well, guess what? We're meant to care about these people and we're the government, we're the last stop. <laughs> we should probably go to the trouble. So you need you need an, an analytical brain that's independent. So we've got one of those. It proved to be a fantastic catalyst. And my understanding is that um, the new government was allowed it to kind of drift along and is probably going to suffocate it by merging it into the equivalent of your DWP. So it'll just disappear, you know. Okay, thank you. That was great. Thank you very much. We talked about officials uh, in this and the system. Uh, let's talk about another important component, which is uh, ministers. We have a work stream on this. Uh, Simone. Um, uh, good, mo good morning, Sir, Sir Bill. Well, good, good, good evening to you. Um, I, I, I can't tell you how much I, I, I totally understand your comments about silos being um, and government not being designed for modern purpose and how how little it all comes across that what you're there for is to serve the citizen and not to communicate the purpose of your department to the rest of government. Um, so it's, it's so, so it, it chimes so completely. And going to this single source of truth and moving on to, um, w when I worked in the cabinet office about five, about 10 years ago now, um, we, we, we actually admired and came to look at the beehive system that you have in New Zealand, which is of course designed to put the ministers I just wonder whether, I don't know whether everyone knows how the beehive system works and whether you could explain whether it does and what the benefits and, and of, of that system were and, and where it doesn't work, I suppose. <laughs> well, we didn't really, you know, most New Zealanders don't know that it's a system. They just think it is how the world is. Uh, so all our ministers are in one building, well, pretty mostly in one building. There's a few in another building. Um, with the prime, literally the prime minister sits on the top floor and then it's you know graded by hierarchy down through the building from ninth floor down and the cabinet rooms on 10th floor. So you have, and they're separate from their ministries. So ministers do not sit in their departments. And I, I, I can, cannot understand how you run a government any other way, frankly, because if they're sitting in their departments, the departments have got them. Right? They, they've, got the, they've got thousands of people literally to preoccupy them and isolate them and brainwash them uh, and train them, of course. I mean, so one of the weaknesses in our system is ministers don't get that well trained because they, 
their exposure to public servants is a bit episodic um, and, and, and not holistic. And I think that happens better in other jurisdictions. But the decision-making process is a lot better. So after the, the New Zealand cabinet process is much more collective than the UK one, right? So the engine rooms of ours are cabinet committees and you generally have four or five of those. They meet at least every week. The chairman of a cabinet committee is quite a powerful figure, but they, they generally work on having to get agreement before you come to cabinet. And that agreement could involve 10 ministers, certainly five or six. And then because they're all in the building, you can have a whole informal stream of activity. So we used to have, uh, like my day as a finance minister, I just took the, sort of said, right, I'm a, like a COO here for 20% of the economy. We've got to make it work. Who are the people who make the decisions? Let's get them in the room uh, and do all this stuff. And you just got to make them, you, you just, the, the, they, ministers like their territory. They want to defend it, all the stuff, you know, you don't need me to tell you about it. But if you get them together enough and create and give them these pictures of what happens to the people who pass through their system, but also through three other systems, give them some things they can count, like literally, you know, there's 47 in this school. Well, what are we doing tomorrow that's going to reduce it to 46? How did that, you know, and, and this other one, there's only 30. How did that happen? That sort of stuff. And so you create, as the finance minister, I had the opportunity just to create bottlenecks. So you can't get any money unless you agree with those other two ministers. Right? Now, you couldn't run that like too, in too authoritarian a way because they'd just go off to the prime minister and complain about you know, I wasn't listening and all that sort of stuff. Um, and so you've got to be careful you don't lose too many of those battles. But it does create, because what it created a great opportunity to, to model the behaviour you want departments to have. Because there's no point saying to departments, you have to behave collectively. By the way, our ministers are all um, free agents who leak to the media and um, brief against their colleagues and never turn up to anything collective. So... And, and, and they have to get the thing that we, I think the thing that critical thing that worked with us is that's a process that creates tension. And we were able to get officials used to tension, right? And say, so, well, ministers yelling at each other is because they care about what we're talking about. You know, I remember we had these big arguments over, um, you know, I mentioned child abuse. It turned out that health, police, and education did not have a shared understanding of what constituted child abuse or the protocols for dealing with it, which was a shock to the politicians. But they were just shocked. They couldn't believe it. We've been dealing with this problem for 30 years and you, and they, you know, cause police aren't going to be told what to do by nurses. Well, you know, there was a bit of bloody yelling went on <laughs> and guess what? The problem got solved reasonably quickly because it turned out to be so embarrassing that's the other thing. We learned how to use embarrassment in front of other ministers. So if your agent, your, your public servants turned up and didn't know what happened to the kids in special ed when they went to the health system, well, I'd just shut down the meeting. Just say, what's the point in having this conversation? You, you, don't, you have no idea what happens to that child outside of the school. So how can you possibly be giving me advice based on a holistic view of the child? So let's come back next week. Um Thank you for that. I mean, it, and, it, and it's 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 a, it's a hugely helpful um, understanding of how, of how to bring it together, which I think we need to be able to do more because I think that officials often wind up uh, ministers in other departments and then uh, about what things they they don't want to happen, and it's far better for the ministers to sit there and have their disagreements rather than finding out that it wasn't really the minister who cared in the first place. Yeah, um, that's right. yeah. So uh, exactly. <laughs> would be a big improvement. Um, just very, um, what, what I, um, you mentioned ministerial training, which we were, we're looking into as part of um, one of our work streams here. But j just, do you feel that in New Zealand, because we went to look, um, when we were looking at these models um, as, as support for ministers, direct support for ministers, if you like, um, do, do you feel that, uh, we looked at the Australian model where they have a bigger ministerial office, um, and in New Zealand, I, I believe it's more akin to the um, UK system. Do you feel that um, New Zealand, ha that ministers had enough support, uh, personal support, if you, if you like, and, and political advice? Uh, yes, 
and sometimes too much. I mean, you've got to, the, the problem with politicians is to try and is, is just you've just got to reduce the amount of space that politics takes up in their head, right? And to do that, you have you, you, because you want to expand the space they spend on actually thinking about the actual problems that for which they got the billions of dollars, right? So you think, how do I get them to think more, spend more time thinking about the 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 the, the um, 11 year old who's 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 sub getting submerged in a noisy classroom and getting nowhere in six weeks they're out you know they kind of lost lost track and less time worried about what their colleagues said about them and that's again the I can't emphasize it enough you need someone in the system who is relentlessly focused on your customers who in every meeting is saying no no that's all fine yeah that's interesting but but we've got 130,000 people over here and we've got 200 million. And what have we done in this meeting again about that? Just remind me. <laughs> and that's, so the training, often the training is a bit too constitutional these days. Uh, what they actually need trained in is to know what to expect of their public servants besides, you know, neutral advice and how to talk to them. And that, that's all sort of civil, political civility is a bloody good thing. You need it. Uh, but they, you think of the world they've come from when they come into, you know, Westminster, um, you know, they're cut off from um, the way the rest of the world works and so are the agencies they deal with. You know, you've, you've got a world now that's hyper-individualised and if you want to find the last place on earth which is dead brain collectivised, you just go to a big government agency and then put a minister in charge of it. So the, the constitutional part of it's right, but their understanding of what constitutes services and, and connection with real people, um, you wouldn't want the public service to training them in that because they don't know. You need other people, you need retailers to train them and Google to train them and Facebook to show them how they got 68 variables on everybody illegally and breached their privacy, but man, they care about their customers. Thank you. Uh, Suma, did you want to say something about the beehive? Yeah, just a, just a story from my misspent youth, actually, you might make uh, Bill laugh. Um, I wasn't a permanent secretary then, but uh, Tony Blair actually liked the Beehive idea a lot and his policy unit. So he actually asked me and a couple of others to go and investigate whether we could turn the QE2 uh, conference centre opposite Westminster Abbey into the Beehive. Um, we were actually quite well down on the planning on this until the security chief said, no way, we were going to put all the cabinet in one place. And that's what actually stopped us from doing it. Um, anyway, I ended up uh, getting into real estate and my next, uh, my next adventure was to sell the dome for Tony Blair. Yeah. Did a slightly better job on, that than on this. But actually so there is a serious issue here about bringing people out of their silos, uh, yeah. whether it's ministers or even, even uh, permanent secretaries or DGs. The most we've ever managed to do is really bring DGs, director generals and the permanent secretaries in mass departments together, whether it's in the justice ministry, development, other places that I work, we did succeed in doing that. That did help to some extent in breaking yeah. the service, but yeah. I would have gone further with Nick and brought the Home Office and Justice Ministry top brass together in one place. Because yeah. frankly, neither of us could achieve our objectives without the other, other ministry. Yeah. And we never and, quite and the, got there. Yeah, and, and the test for it is, have they got a strong enough sense of purpose and of progress that they'll keep turning up, right? So they shouldn't be turning up because cabinet said so, they should be turning up because... And so the way to think about that is, you, you, as you say, those things, you can make some progress and there's 15 reasons why it's hard, but you need more collective ministerial stuff. The other way at the same time to think about it is that regardless of what the minister does, you need different consumer models of service. And the obvious, the, the, the obvious ones now are self-direction, that is, you, you locate, you actually hand the resource to the agent of the actual family. I mean, we're in a business where we do this with 5,000 people with chronic disabilities. Um, they cash out their care into the budgets. And um, it's amazing what it does. These are the most, the least able people in the community. And they can, they're making, and they, they all become employers. They will be your agent. So self-direction is one which I'm increasingly a fan of. You know, the public services philosophy is designed, it's got the social determinism 
and, and hopelessness, and that is they believe these people are hopeless. Well, actually, you get a complicated person with a complicated life, they can tell you which problem needs to be solved first. They actually can. And 10% of them will get it wrong, but 90% of them, you just fix, fix one problem and the next two or three come right. Um, and I can tell you a lot of stories about that because I used to spend a fair bit of time into the, talking to them. Uh, so self-direction is one. And the other one is the actual highly localized, trusted relationship with a small budget. Right? You're, you're not going to change your complex families unless a person knows that family and can work with them over a period of time. And if they're not doing that, don't waste your money. Because we have 50 years of failure of the traditional social work model. And how much failure do you need to believe it's not working? You know, when Lyndon Bain Johnson declared the war on poverty, everyone thought it was going to be over by 1975. Well, guess what? Everyone thinks it's worse now, <laughs> 40 years later. So, you know, this is a, and, and that's the ultimate thing about why you, you, why you need a commission for smart government, because the public service, I've been in it and out of it for 30 years, um, and uh, it can't change, and it doesn't react to failure. It's lost its reaction function. And by failure, I mean human tragedy. That is lives that we meant to change, we intended to change, and actually we made harder because we won't change ourselves. That's the measure. And they just keep on going. And as I think I said before, one of the real problems is the cynicism in the system now. I gave a talk in Australia about this just before lockdown last year. And I was a big room of senior public servants said, how many people, hands up, how many people think you could have significant change in the way your services are delivered? And no one put their hand up. Okay, so you've, you've got to light some fires of inspiration in these people because they're good people. They're just in a system that was designed for something else. Well, thank you. That's, that, uh, that is a brilliant way to, to end part one of this um, evidence session. And you've certainly lit a fire and uh, lots for us to think about. You've been a brilliant witness. Thank you very much uh, indeed. Um, I'm so pleased that you were able to join us. I do hope that you uh, will stay for this second half and, and join in. Um, if you'd like to, we totally understand if you want to go to bed. Uh, but uh, <laughs> And I think we'd very much as, a, as commissioners would like to stay in touch with you actually, because I think we would benefit hugely from your uh, insight as someone who's been thinking about these issues uh, for so long, uh, if we may. So thank you very much. Thank you very much for the opportunity. I will just pop out for a moment and then I'll come back and have a listen. Lovely, thank you, uh, we're delighted. So, so let's move to part two. Um, and we're really pleased that um, uh, John Micklethwaite and Adrian Woolridge um, uh, are able to join us and have been uh, listening in to, uh, to, to part one. And so we uh, move uh, to evidence from them. Uh, and um, Michael Bichard, you're going to kick off. Yeah, I, perhaps I could just make one point in relation to Bill's contribution. I'm sorry he's gone. I, Bill's focus on customer was music to my ears. Um, I don't know how many conversations I have with civil servants who are much cleverer than I was about whether we should use the term customer, user, citizen, client. And in the end, I said, I really don't care what words you use, but I do draw the line at victim and supplicant, which was probably a better definition of how we treated these people uh, than, than, than anything else. The serious point I want to make in that uh, context though, Nick, is that Bill also said that the top tier of people, of officials often don't understand the real life situations that people experience. And I agree with that. I think we should just be a little bit self-critical looking around the table at just how connected we are with users and customers and whether when you set up a smart government commission, we just need to find ways of making that connection before we produce yet further recommendations which are based in the institutions and not focused on whatever you want to call them. So I just wanted to make that point before asking 
a question, John and, and, and Adrian, thanks so much for, for being with us. Um, uh, the question I want to ask really is what you think, I've not had a chance yet to read through your, your book, which I will do, but what you think the pandemic has told us about the ability of governments to deliver resource, the capacity to deliver results, the capacity of governments to make a difference. Um, what do you think it's taught us? I go first. I mean, sorry, first, first I say thank you for having us. And um, it was worth coming just to listen to Bill. We should have um, made more of the, we thought about the beehive thing for our book and we should have, it would have been an interesting one to throw in and we'll come back to that. Um, in terms of the pandemic, I think it's a really simple thing. It's the simplest way to think of the pandemic is it's like an exam you set sort of pupils. Um, and it, from the point of view of what you're trying to do, I think it's in a horrible, grisly way. It's, it's certainly illustrative. It shows that government, it, it, all the way around the world, government was the difference between living and dying. Um, it, whether you had a government that worked actually made a colossal difference. Um, and it, the pandemic was sort of like an exam that you set a, a group of pupils. And I think everyone on this call um, would have been able to guess most of the governments, including New Zealand, that were good. Um, we would have probably all got a few of them a bit wrong. Um, I don't think many of us would have guessed that Greece would do as well as it did. It turns out it had a very good prime minister. We, the irony, I just I interviewed the Singaporean prime minister this week and I only just recently checked. They are in trouble in Singapore They're having a death rate of, of five per million, which they think is horrific. Um, we are 700, <laughs> 750 per million. And, and I think that's the sort of point is that the, this test showed where, where governments basically work. And, and the easiest way to measure it is to look at those numbers of deaths per million. It's, it's a very crude thing. And there will be people on this call who will point out that some numbers are too high and others are too low. But the differences, especially when you compare it to the private sector are so astounding. Um, you, the, if you look at the numbers where around 750 deaths per million, the, a bit higher than that, America's about the same. You get down to Germany, which I see is another of the questions, that's down around 150, so six times better. But the real point is you go out to Asia and places like South Korea, um, uh, Taiwan, Japan, all these places are down around sort of 20, 30 deaths per million, sometimes smaller than that. If you want to really, and, and there's a sort of rather lame excuse out there that it's something to do with culture. Um, you, you look at London, you look at New York, and you look at Seoul. They are all big, bustling mega cities. Actually, Seoul is a little bit bigger than London or, 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 or New York. And New York has lost 25,000 people uh, going up again. London's lost 6,000 people. Seoul's lost about 50. And Seoul is a place that produced Parasite. It has some of the world's biggest nightclubs, which I'm sure you've all been to. It's the home of K-pop, which at least some of your children and our children know about. This is, this is not some regimented place. It's just somewhere, it's just simply knew how to make things work. Um, it had a very good mayor, sadly, who ended it somewhat unfortunately. But they, they, it's, it's a big chaotic place, but it did actually know how government worked. And I think it, it, it was a test of government functionability, and you can make exceptions around the edge. And that's one reason why it's important. And the second reason is if you look at China, and here I suppose I'm looking slightly more through American eyes than through British, but I think it's still relevant, is that you look at China, China claims a number of three deaths for every million people. Um, well, I think we'd all agree on this call that maybe it's exactly, you know, it's, it's cheating a bit. <laughs> probably have more journalists than any other Western organization in China. They will tell you it's actually quite difficult to find COVID in many parts of China. But imagine they're lying and it's 30 deaths. They would still be 25 times better than us, 25 times better than America at protecting their people. Um, and even if you, you go into the bad things that China did at the beginning, that we think that's a fairly horrific thing, partly because it shows in big, and this is where we get big and pretentious, is that you know 500 years ago the Chinese were best at government we got better we, we outdid Asia by being 
better at government. You know, we competed against it, we forced each other. We reacted in a sense of competition, a bit like the sort of thing that which Bill was sort of talking about. We, we were so desperate to be better than the French um, that we did things, we, we, in many cases, we blew each other out of the water. But we did, we kept on pushing ahead. And I think since, particularly since the 60s, you've seen this rise of Asian government and the Chinese are now copying other people and they're trying to catch up. So there is a geopolitical edge to this as well. Um, that, that it's not just to do with does go, COVID was not just about does government work. In the end, you know, we, we argue that when historians look back at this year, if they decide this was the year when Asia began to get past the West, especially in terms of government, they, all the other things that so obsess us at the moment, Brexit, whether Trump got this number of votes in Georgia, vaccines, all those things, they won't matter. That will be the big thing that people look back on COVID about. And so that's the reason why we think COVID is important and why we think what you're doing is incredibly important. But what, coming on maybe to Adrian, I mean, you've identified how important it is, or how important good government is, it, you know, it, it saves lives. But you've, you've identified different levels of achievement around the world but what is it that makes the difference i mean what is it that enables some governments to deliver results uh, and others to focus i'm being pejorative much more on policy than results well well, well in, in in the end it's a lot to do with taking it seriously it, it, go back to what i said earlier it, again if i'd asked i mean a, a horrific thought experiment but if i'd asked all of you on this call to write down who had governments that were capable of dealing with this sort of thing i think you would have got most of them right and the reason why is you look at the health league tables you look at the education league table the, the, the same countries that did well with covid are the same ones which finished the top of those things um, and what's frightening about that on the geopolitical level, and again here, you know, I just checked the PISA things on education the other day. You know, China cheats on that by only using a few cities, but it is at the top of that. And, th and that doesn't mean all our public sectors are not good. You know, there are bits of there are universities, there are defence, there's a lot, there's the, the treasury, the, the, there are bits we do really quite well. But in general, if you look at it from the customer point of view, which you've just heard, you know, would you, are you safer, better educated if you're in Singapore, Korea, Japan, all those different countries we talked about, or are you in, in the West? And I, you asked what the difference is. Um, and there are lots of sort of, I, I think the idea that it's something to do with authoritarianism is rubbish. Um, most of the countries, there is a false positive. People look at um, the fact that China did better than America and say, oh, that's because it's more authoritarian. Uh, it's the only authoritarian place which did well, to be honest. Um, all, the, the, all the other places, Russia, Iran, you wouldn't want to get COVID in North Korea. They all, they all did badly. Um, the, if you look at the, the sort of the places where, you know, Singapore, yes, it can be quite stern in some ways, but the real reason why its schools do well is because it promotes good teachers and sacks bad ones. And we, are, we seem to be unable to do that. And I'm, this is... <coughs> Partly because the right wing doesn't believe in paying good teachers enough money, and the left wing doesn't think about the necessity of getting rid of bad ones. So you look, you look across the sectors of why these things work. You know, some other people talk about technology. Uh, it's certainly true that if you leave any kind of British, certainly if you leave in an American airport and you go to Asia. I mean, again, this is this was such an obvious thing. You, you, you LaGuardia was been part of my life for the past five years. You may go to Asia, it, it's a difference like moving through several centuries. Um, it, well, not maybe centuries, certainly decades. Um, the, the sort of smart government infrastructure, all these sort of things, these places are big, that does not mean they pulled ahead of us. And the reason why we called the book, The Wake Up Call, because we think we can wake up, but at the core of it, I think there is an element which your commission is an admirable exception to of taking government seriously. You know, there is a, Li Kuan Yu was haunted by things. The Chinese, the Chinese are totally aware of the history, I've just said. They're totally aware that they used to be the best people at government. They invented mandarins, they did all this sort of stuff, and then they lost that. Um, Japan, other places, places of lost war, they're all taking this seriously. A hundred years ago, 
we we pushed through these welfare reforms and set up the modern welfare state or began it in part because we were compassionate in a way that many of the people on this call would think was a good thing. But we also did it. People like Winston Churchill backed conservative people 100 years ago, backed the, the origins of our welfare state because they, more than 100 years ago, because they were terrified of Germany. So national competition, these sort of things, we've forgotten about that. And, and Britain, Britain is, from our perspective, certainly in the reception of the book, is actually, we're listening a lot more than America is. Um, and that, 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 which is an interesting point. Anyway, so I've talked enough. No, no, it's very good. P Paul. Yeah, um, John and Adrian, it's, it's brilliant to have you um, on this call and I, I'm really looking forward to reading your book. Um, I'm gonna reverse, the, you were sent a couple of questions in advance. I'm just gonna flip the order of those two questions, if I may. So start with um, what would have been the supplemental, which is what does the COVID experience reveal about the weakness in the UK public administration in your eyes? And then to follow on from that, what can we learn particularly from European governments, Germany, uh, and are there strengths in their institutions and systems which have put some of them at least in a better position than us to navigate uh, the crisis? But maybe start with the weaknesses in, in, um, in the UK. I'm muted myself. Um, let, me, let, let, let me answer that question. Um, it's a very long list of weaknesses that have been revealed, but I won't go through everything because that will keep us here all day. I think the, the, the obvious thing that was revealed was slowness. We were very slow to respond on every possible dimension in terms of getting PPE, um, in, in terms of getting uh, 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 vaccines, in, in terms of just a, a sense of uh, understanding the sheer scale of, of this threat. I think The Economist put the uh, question of uh, a cover saying it's going global um, uh, uh, at the end of January. And I remember at that very day, on that very day, um, having lunch uh, with um, a minister, a junior minister, I won't say who it was, but the junior minister uh, I was talking to hadn't heard of uh, Neil Ferguson and thought I was talking about the historian, didn't realize there was another Neil Ferguson, who that very morning had been on the radio talking about just how huge that pandemic was gonna be, um, which I thought was quite, quite a story. This was somebody intimately involved with, with, with health, I would just say. So we, we were slow to get our mind around that. We were very distracted by Brexit and the rest of it, but I think the prime minister was culpable. He didn't go to the first uh, four or five COVID meet meetings. Um, he was distracted in various ways. I think in the system, there was a lack of preparedness and resilience insofar as we had, we were thinking about long-term threats. We were thinking about influenza rather than COVID. And we changed that direction really very slowly. Um, and again, when Boris Johnson became ill with COVID, um, we didn't even know who would be second in the order of precedence to become deputy prime minister. It was the great faff about who would be deputy prime minister. That's an extraordinary lack of resilience um, and lack of preparation in a, in a political system. Uh, you would have thought, you know, the Americans have a vice president, uh, the office of the vice president for precisely this reason. We, we sort, sort of hadn't, uh, hadn't considered it. Um, so centralization, I think is, uh, over centralization is obviously a huge problem. Um, we have, I think, one of the most centralized government systems in the world. Um, I think in terms of the percentage of GDP that local governments spend rather than central governments, it's less than 10%. And I think we're only equaled by Portugal and Luxembourg in OECD countries. And those are both, of course, very, very small countries. And this lack of centralization is sort of self-reinforcing that because we don't have, because we have a very centralized system, you don't have very good people going into local government. Um, and because you don't have very good people in local government, then the government is, central government is very nervous of local government and tends not to give it decisions, decision-making powers, because it doesn't think that people are gonna, gonna be able to deal with it. And the compromise that we've produced in terms of uh, local mayors, uh, regional mayors, which I'm very much in favor of, has nevertheless had a slightly um, difficult 
um, consequence because they can blame all problems on Whitehall, um, claim all benefits to themselves and use this as a sort of constant process of agitation. So the, 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 the relationship between central and local government is, is very problematic in this country. Um, and we have a strange monopolization as, uh, as well that the public service doesn't instinctively cooperate with the private sector. It instinctively tries to keep it out. So we saw Public Health England um, not cooperating with the private sector, thinking that, that, that that's all reagents had to be located internally, all uh, testing uh, had to be done internally. We saw the same thing repeated with the Test and Trace app. Uh, and that was, that, that was just an unnecessary um, self-provincialism, uh, really, I suppose. And finally, I, and perhaps most importantly, we have a system where the cabinet um, responsibilities were not very well worked out. That basically you had um, a cabinet structure that wasn't equal to the COVID crisis in the sense that large numbers of people didn't have enough to do and other people had far too much to do. Um, and a very sm small handful of, of cabinet ministers basically dominated the whole system. Um, they were constantly on the radio. They had to deal with public issues. They had to deal with presentational issues. They had to deal with pit political issues. And they had to deal with organizational issues. And I'm thinking primarily of, of Matt Hancock, who I think did a good job, but was really massively overstretched. Um, and so I think we, we need at the center of government a, a much clearer sense of the distinction between the political functions which cabinet secretaries, uh, cabinet ministers had to perform and operational functions. And it took some time, I think, you know, to bring in people like Paul Dayton to look after PPE. And that was a, a, a very belated recognition that, 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 that you can't do everything all at once. You can't, you can't be on, on, on the Today programme and then organising the, 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 the requisition of PPE and the rest of it. So a few cabinet ministers massively overburdened and a lot of other cabinet ministers, I think, left left uh, with, 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 with no role in the process uh, except gabbing around a bit. Um, and now Germany is um, an interesting example here. John mentioned the figures earlier about 750 per million compared with, uh, for Britain, compared with 150 million in Germany, which is an astonishing difference. And as John said, if you saw that sort of difference in the private sector, it would very rapidly be eliminated because the, 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 the outlier would either go out of business or would learn from the other country um, or the other company involved. I think some of that is to do with Merkel. I mean, Merkel is exactly the sort of cabinet, the, the sort of leader you want for this type of crisis. She's a scientist, she's methodical, she um, doesn't go for grand rhetoric um, and she's, you know, extremely experienced. And we had, in many ways, the opposite of those things at the top of our, uh, at the top of our government. A new government coming in, um, relatively new, um, with a big project on its hand in the form of Brexit, and an emphasis on campaigning, winning campaigns rather than governing. But I think there's a, there's a lot more to, to, to Germany's success than, 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 than just the differences of individuals at the top. I think this, the federal system there, uh, federal versus local government, obviously is very well entrenched and it worked very well in this, in this case. It didn't have this tension, which we're seeing pulling our system apart. And it had a, also had a public health system, which is extremely decentralized. Ours is very centralized and has got a lot more centralized over the years and the role of local government has been squeezed out. Theirs is all under the control of, of local governments. And you have these directors of public health who are very powerful people, very well established and entrenched people who have large staffs. Um, and they, I think, have done you know, really well in responding to this. We, with us, everything has gone through uh, the central system, um, within England, that is. Um, and um, it hasn't been that good at designing uh, things for, for, local, for, for local people. Um, so I would say those, you know, basically our problem, and it's a very, very difficult problem in, in, in England uh, and Great Britain in general, because, because England is 84% of the population and uh, Scotland is, 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 is a tiny percentage of that. But the big problem we confront is a problem of, 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 of how to create 
effective local governments within this within the United Kingdom, I think. And, the, the, and John was talking about the, you know, this is a series of stress tests. What this has really revealed above all else is that the relationship between central and local government is dysfunctional. Local government is is un, it's too weak, it's under-resourced, and it's very amateurish. And Germany is a is an example of of how local government, if it's properly organized, can be an incredibly powerful way of delivering health services. Thank, thank you. Can I just ask one supplemental to, to yeah. that, Nick? Yeah, sure. sure. Um, you're, you're just coming back, back to the UK, um, quite a lot of your answers were, I would say, related to the politics of it as opposed to the uh, executive arm. I mean, you talked about centralization and so on. But um, from my perspective, we ended up calling in, you cited Paul Dighton as, a, as an exa a good example, but then there's also Dido Harding um, and um, sorry, sorry, Paul. Paul, Paul Dayton. And then, and uh, we, now you've gone, Adrian's frozen. Is that me or Adrian? I think it's Adrian, isn't it? I, 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 can, I can answer, so keep okay. going. <laughs> let, me, let me finish with a question. Um, we ended up bringing in Paul Dayton, Dido Harding, and Jesse Norman's uh, partner to run three, the three, mo three of the most strategic things. I thought that's what the civil service was for. It seems to be extraordinary, and all for, for porosity, but it seems to be extraordinary that the three most important, uh, exec arguably executive jobs that need to get done by the center, we, in all three cases, we recruited somebody from outside rather than um, having somebody there who knew how to do it and could deliver for us. I mean, it, and other, okay. other, other governments in Asia where you, you could have just said, okay, here's our, here's our capable civil servant, get this done, please. Well, that, that, that's up, a large, please. that's a large part of our, that's a large part of our argument. If again, you know, we, our, our book is a short book and it co covers a huge amount of, of, of ground. But, you know, to be very basic about it, and I apologize to people on this call who, 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 who accept and stuff again, but in general, you know, what, if you look at places like, if you look at how, and there's a question later, I think from Simone about Singapore, you, you, you look at how Singapore's done well, it's that thing where it, it is largely about the people. Um, if you bring in, um, if you give the head of your civil service over a million dollars a year, yeah. Um, Possibly, sometimes more than that. They only got a million dollars this year. Um, if you if you give scholarships to people to come into the civil service early, you send them to universities away. Then you breed you you breed, for lack of a better word, a, a cadre of people who are completely used to this yeah, sort of exactly. style of responsibility. The British one is to panic and then bring in these people from outside without any um, sense of it. And it is a, again in the book we make the argument there are people in this thing who may disagree with this, but what really interested us is you, you go back to the 1960s, we think that was the last, in terms of measuring the, the West against the East, we argued that that was really the last time, that was the, that was the moment when the West was furthest ahead of the East. Very, most obviously you had kind of America dreaming of putting a man on the moon whilst millions of Chinese were dying of starvation. But it was also the sort of time when Singapore began to do what it did in the same way as oddly what happened on industries um, happened on um, um, the Japanese were doing in cars. The, the big difference being that when it came to cars, the Japanese took our ideas and then we fought back and copied them. So every factory around the world ended up adopting lean manufacturing. Um, by contrast, when it came to government, we haven't done, but the, but the reason why, one of the big reasons why, when you look back at the 1960s and say, why did it diverge? And this is very generalistic, but certainly in America, and to some extent in Britain, we thought that was the last time that people really trust, both trusted government to do the right thing. And also it's the last time where public sector and private sector jobs had some degree of equivalence where the rewards weren't so completely outlandish. And, and the, one of the biggest problems with government in the West, it goes a bit back to Paul and Michael's questions at the end, at the beginning, is that, that, that so many talented people, with the again, exceptions in this room, don't go anywhere near it. Um, and that, that the, the way in which people leave Harvard, Oxford, whatever, and go straight into the private sector, and in many ways, live their lives 
which are completely remote to this is we think a, a very a very big and important thing and one one reason why we actually talk about non-military national service is, is partly in, in unison that, that that if you look through the history of government and you can for people on this who, who've also looked at this you look at the theory of government the moment you have an elite that has very little to do with government you really have problem um, and that I think is throughout it. it's a very long it's slightly long answer to your problem but to your question but yes that is the in terms of what is the what feels different about going to those places it's just simply the, the, the quality of people who they're trying to attract in at the bottom. It's the level to which elites are involved in government and so on and so on. Not in a kind of panicky, Dido hard doing, bring her in way, but in the sense that it, this, is, this is something that they've wanted to draw on throughout. Yeah. Uh, J Jane Ann Guardia has um, been uh, listening uh, on her phone and uh, would like to ask the next question if you're there, Jane Ann. I am. Can you hear me, Nick? Yes, absolutely. Excellent. Thank you very much. And thanks for such a fascinating session. I'd like to move us on to the business world a bit, if I can. Um, you've suggested that many of the solutions for the problems that currently face governments like ours must lie in working more effectively with business and especially with entrepreneurs. How do you think that the government can create the conditions for that to happen? And if I may, I'll just add a, a supplementary given what you've just said, because you've described our economy, or at least the modern economy, as the brains economy. What countries are the best at bringing in brains from the private sector to government and, and how could we learn from what they do? Adrian's back. Oh, so yeah, I'm, I'm back. I apologise. Technology collapsed momentarily there. Um, <laughs> how can government create the conditions for entrepreneurs to work well in government? I think, you know, we talk a lot in this book about how there seem to be two different worlds. You know, CPSO talks about, you know, the two cultures. And we do seem to have two cultures uh, at the moment. One is a public sector culture, which is, which is, which is diffident, which is slow moving. Um, and which isn't very technologically savvy. Uh, and on the other hand, we have uh, a high tech, high entrepreneurial culture, which moves very fast, which is recreating the world in very big um, and exciting ways. Um, and the great challenge of our time is really to, to bring these two together and make the public sector a bit, more, a, bit, a, a bit more entrepreneurial, a bit more like the private sector. And I think in some ways, the COVID has been rather good for that because it has you know, exemplified the, the, the gap between the two, two of the systems. What we've seen is private companies very rapidly adapting to this new world um, and governments finding it much, much harder to, to adapt. Um, it's sort of underlined that. But at the same time, um, it's particularly in, in Britain recently, it's the, the crisis has also revealed some of the um, some of the weaknesses of that rather simplistic model of saying, well, let's just call for a private sector person and bring them in. We've seen an, an extraordinary number of examples of badly designed contracts, of panicked um, uh, acquisition of PPE and things to bring in PPE. And we've seen, you know, the worst sort of cronyism, the sort of cronyism that the Northcote Trevelyan reforms of the mid 19th century were designed to rule out, sort of coming back in in that people said, well, who's my friend? Uh, you know, people in uh, MPs, Lords and the rest of it sort of tapping into their personal networks to, to, to get problems solved very quickly. It's an inevitable in some ways response to the need for speed, but it has brought in some very bad consequences, which I think are pushing, is pushing public opinion very hard in the other direction that we actually um, need to need to be very suspicious of, of, of the private sector. So I think the most important thing um, is to be good at negotiating contracts and be good at identifying people who can solve problems rather than doing it through personal networks, have some sort of structure to this sort of thing. So that's my biggest uh, answer to the question of how, how we work better with the, the private sector. We, we, we need to systematize it um, to some extent. Um, my other is to, you know, big projects um, are a very, very good way of demonstrating the power of the public sector. We've had a very panicked response, but the, the, the private sector uh, has, at its best, been really good at doing uh, big, big projects. And I, I'm thinking particularly of, you know, the Indian government bringing in Nandan Nilikani 
uh, and saying, you know, how can you get digital IDs for everybody? That was a massive project, incredibly ambitious, and made a huge difference to, to, to the country. So don't just bring in the private sector in, in a panicked way, bring it in, 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 in a very considered way to deal with big, big problems. And my other big recommendation would be, you know, prizes. I think prizes are incredibly powerful ways of structuring uh, cooperation and using the, the private sector to solve public sector problems. So the public sector defines the problem and encourages lots of private sector people to, to come up with solutions. It's obviously, the, you know, this is how we got this, the longitudinal uh, prize in the 17, the early 18th century, 1714, I think it was, was a classic example of using this, but I'd like to see lots, lots more of that. So it's almost as though we now use the, the private sector as a last resort, which we look at it in a state of panic, rather than trying to structure relations in the long term. In terms of countries that are very, very good at... Oh, Adrian's uh, frozen. He's disappeared um, again. Um, John, can you... I, 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 don't, I, I can't, although we could, we're normally very good at synchronising each other, I can't tell you exactly <laughs> which the countries he was about to mention are. But, but in, gen, in, in general, I think the, you know, the, the underlying point is a kind of basic one, is that, yes, this, this, in many ways at the moment, both, it's like both sides of the political divide get it wrong. Um, you, you saw in the, you know, the number of lives that were lost by the control freakery of Public Health England and not bringing in private labs and things like that was terrible and not thinking, if you have a dynamic private sector, thinking of different ways of borrowing it, using things. On the other hand, um, this sort of knee jerk help, the civil servants are no good, we must bring in somebody from outside when there's a disaster, that, 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 is, that is not very helpful either. I mean, you, you, again, there are people on this call who have had to go through this on a longer basis. But that, you know, that stands out. And we, we, we used to be very good at bringing the best and the brightest, um, to coin a phrase in the 1960s, that used to be a big part of what people did in government. And, and it, it stands, again, there are exceptions. Different people at different times have used it, but it just stands out like a sore thumb. If you look at the, over the past 50, 60 years, you look at the way in which, especially the, the cleverest people get involved in things, and especially young young people get involved in things, both in the, there are, there are terrible gaps. People asked about technology. You know, again, I know the numbers from America, but not from, from Britain, but there's there's one commission, which I think showed that the number of, if you look at the federal, depart, federal government's technology departments, you have, I think, five times as many people over 60 as under 30. And, and as a result, you have really old legacy software, um, which is unmendable, except by the people who've been trained in it. And that is that is a consequence of not getting enough sort of young, clever people in the one end. On the other end, we're very clear, this is, if you look at the, the really powerful elite of the world, and you believe anything that you hear their mouth about knowledge economy, what what is, what is horrifying is how few of them have got involved in public life, um, especially on the technology side. If you look at the really richest people in the world, again, I would be nice about my boss and that, who was a mayor and who I think had a beehive system when he, he very much he ran New York from a single room and made sure everyone was there. But with the exception of him and Bill Gates, there really is not the same connection remotely um, between the new rich um, in the West and government that there once was. And that, that is, again, historically a big difference. Thank you. Jane, do, do you have a follow-up or, or should we move on? Can I quickly I just... I think we can move on. Well, yeah. I, I just wanted to finish my answer on, on answer getting, the bringing country. in talent. Sorry, I disappeared again because of my unstable internet, which I, for which I apologise. But I was just thinking in terms of who's good at bringing in talent from outside. And the paradox here is that the, some of the people who are good at it are also bad at it. Um, and I mean, you know, classically in that, the, the American government, uh, you know, the, the US has been incredibly bad at bringing in talented people who can deal with these problems during this current crisis because of the nature of the current president. But quite often, you know, because of the way the system works, they do bring in a lot of very, very good people from outside. 
um, that uh, who, who can think about these problems and, uh, and address them and solve them. And the classic example, I suppose, would be, you know, bringing in all of those people from the world of finance, you know, uh, before, but just luckily before the last financial crisis, you know, America's response to the financial crisis um, was, was swift and impressive and more impressive than Europe's precisely because they had people like, like Hank Poulsen, um, who had a massive background in the, in the private sector. So you know, it, it's strange that there's a big upside to the system of rotation that they have, um, but also a big downside as we've we, we, we seen more recently. The other country I'd point to um, is a more peculiar one, which is Israel, which is because of the, the way the IDF works is, is incredibly good at, uh, at using high tech solutions to government problems because the government and the military and the, the, the private sector are so closely intertwined. Thank you. Um, Hussein. Great. So thank you both. Uh, the role of technology is center stage in your vision for a smart government. And as a follow up to the previous points around there being this gap uh, around private and public sector in particular, and how uh, in Asian countries they've been able to react more effectively to, to COVID-19. How do we catch up? You mentioned the talent and pay gap. You mentioned the culture gap. You, you mentioned uh, sort of the prestige and uh, the duty bound nature of sort of public service. Um, what else can be done to essentially address and close this gap? I get, shall I go? I mean, one, you, you look at Asia, one, 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 there, there are several things. Um, just, just to give you one example, I mean, one, one thing um, which people normally cite as being a sort of libertarian problem is that one, one of the things that Chinese can do in Shanghai is if you get onto a particular subway car they'll identify whether you got on and then they if somebody gets covid they'll be able to get in contact with you and the conventional response in the west which we share is to say how awful imagine the chinese government knowing you've been on the subway car um, if you live in new york you've only just got as far as kind of cashless ticketing it's not just it's not just the reason the reason why this is impossible and why um, so many people have died is not just a matter of kind of liberalism, it's a matter of technology, just not having the right stuff. Um, so that, so that there, is, there is a need for investment. I talked about technology. Many bits of Western government got stuck in the same situation where you have a huge amount of old legacy technology with old legacy people around it. And so the annual budget just goes into trying to make that stuff just about work rather than beginning and renewing again. Um, there are things to do with um, the smart cities and things like that where Asia is getting further ahead. And that's just simply a matter of spending money and thinking about it the way that the internet's done in America and so on. These are, these are all areas where you need more money. The only bit I would say, and it goes a bit back to the previous question, is that on the whole, when we looked for technology being the reason why some countries have got better at government than others. Um, yes, it was there, but it tends to be more of a symptom than a cause. Again, you know, the, the, the classic example is education. Um, people have spent lots of time trying to chuck technology into education. I mean, in the end, you look at those league tables, it's a really simple story. You hire good teachers and you sack bad ones. It's not, it's not really any different than that. You can put, you can put all kinds of clever, you could put, idealistic things on it saying it's something to do with being authoritarian you could put other say that people have spent the people who spent money pumping sort of different but technology with bad teachers will not help you um and i'm sure bill english would say the same thing about some of the things he was talking about yes you can use technology cleverly with policing we've seen that um yes you can use it in different ways and and the degree to which parts of the western public sector is so shabby and old is 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 a sort of is by itself a problem. But in general, the the inability to use technology is more symptomatic of a, and, and it's it, it goes quite a lot to this idea about are you prepared to invest in things that would help your society? So I hope does that answer your question? Yeah, it does. Thank you. I don't know if I have time for a quick follow up. Very quick, so yeah, because I, I want to go to Chris next, but please uh, do. 
John, you made the point around authoritarian regime and how this is unrelated to how effective they've been. But what it's about? Not, it's not unrelated. It's less. It, it's, less it's, 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 uh, yeah. precise, it's probably exaggerated, exactly as you say. How about the data privacy consideration and legislation? So, touching on your point around going into a subway and so on, that is something that seems quite different uh, in the two regions, and the, the, whether that is relevant or not. There's some, there's some, if you, the more we looked at COVID, the basic thing is who's done test and trace well. I mean, who's, who, who is two basic things? Have you got the trust of your system, which goes all the way through all the things you've been talking about today? So but governments that were trusted did quite well. And, and there were ones which were trusted and possibly did the wrong thing, like Sweden's. Um, but on the whole, the, the countries that were trusted quite well. And the other one was just simply being, having the capacity to organize test and trace it's not it's not that difficult and uh, uh, there at the margin yeah sometimes i mean in china the ability to test an entire city in a matter of time um that has an authoritarian edge but most again m the places we're talking about that did better than us um they yes they bought some of them bought in temporary measures some of them a bit stronger than us but really that the underlying thing was competence of the system it was a system that worked um you know these are not these are again i go back to the seoul versus london and new york thing this this was not this was not something this was not something that was to do with sort of massive degrees of authoritarianism thank you um that's very interesting uh chris thank you so um singapore has come up in in a lot of our conversation and um uh has come up in this conversation um and the, the the most striking thing that you um, describe about it is the difference in financial value um, reward to um, senior public servants. Um, but I wonder, you know, whether this actually represents a difference in view about the role of the state, you know, and whether that reward difference is then a symptom of that difference of view about the role of the state. Um, I wonder if you either either of you care to comment on that. Yeah, I mean, the, there are many reasons why we're fa fascinated by Singapore. One is, of course, that Singapore has been relatively good at dealing with COVID. But the other uh, and equally important thing is that Singapore is relatively good at all sorts of things. Um, it's it's very good at education. It's very good at health. Um, it delivers a very good public service. Um, for its citizens uh, in difficult circumstances um, and um, keep, keeps on doing that. It has a culture of excellence in, 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 its, in its civil service. Um, and I think that what's interesting about Singapore is it's the first country uh, really to produce a new theory of government. That's a very comprehensive theory of government. One of the things we argue in this book is that the West pulled ahead of China um, because it was constantly innovating. And one of the ways it innovated was to produce a succession of theories of government which were compelling and suited to their time. So you have Hobbes's theory of protecting people from unnecessary harm through a state monopoly of violence. You have Mill's theory of an accountable, limited government that is not corrupt, that, 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 that gets rid of corruption and, 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 uh, and systems of relief for the aristocratic classes. Then you have the Webb's theory of broadening the notion of security to in, in, in include not just physical security, but security um, from uh, ignorance and wants and, uh, and lack of education uh, and old age, lack of uh, resources and the rest of it. And what you saw in Singapore um, in the 1960s, really, in, in the brain, essentially, of Lee Kuan Yew, was the idea uh, of a new theory of the state. One is, and his notion is that the state really, really matters, that unless we can get government rights, um, we're not going to really make it here. It's not just a matter of, uh, uh, of letting the market rip, it's a matter of the government taking on uh, the right role. He had the notion of excellence or meritocracy versus democracy. He said, well, the West has gone crazy about democracy. We want a system that's meritocratic, that's focused on excellence and all the rest of it. He had a notion of a sort of robust but limited welfare state. So he would say, well, the West has this welfare state, which is a sort of all you can eat buffet. He talked about he, and he said, here, we'll have a welfare state, but it'll be austere and will demand responsibility from people. And he also said that the state has a, an important role 
in pushing companies, encouraging companies up the value chain. Um, so it's a developmental state. So it's activist, developmental, it shifts company, you know, it encourages the creation of a knowledge economy. And this, 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 this is the first, I think, really coherent view of the state, um, which we've seen not coming from the West for, for a long time, a coherent but plus effective. Um, and I think that the, the fact that China, for all its faults, is beginning to look at a lot of those ideas and beginning to try and try and implement those ideas on the, uh, the gigantic scale of China, rather than on the much smaller scale of Singapore, is a historically important moment. This is the first time that a, a, a new view of the state and its capacities and its obligations has flourished outside the outside the West, and it's a very powerful uh, view of the state. So that's why we. Uh, we thought that the, let's look at the COVID test. Let's see how this the, this new state is responding to the COVID crisis. And lo and behold, it's responding extremely well and rather better than our state. So it's revealed some of the faults of, of our system. And I would say what really has worked in Singapore is this obsession with excellence in the public sector. So the public sector isn't something that's, that people go into as the last resort. It's something they go into because they think this is a really good way of making a career not just because you can make money, a reasonable living out of it, because you can get a lot of honor and status out of it. Whereas in the West, you, you, you don't get that much honor and status as, as naturally as, as going into, in, into the private, uh, into the public sector in the same way that you do in the private sector. It's a dynamic sector that learns from other people's mistakes. So it's constantly changing and trying to, trying to improve. Um, and if you look at China's response to, to COVID and compare it with China's response to SARS, you see a system that has learned and improved very, very rapidly. It's learned both in terms of its logistical capacity to, to deal with, 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 with the crisis, but also in terms of its innovation capacity, in terms of its ability to study and see what's, what's going on. So you're seeing a system that's moving very, very rapidly. So um, it's a long way of saying, I think there's a new model of the state out there focused on, you know, first developed in Singapore, which is the biggest and most serious challenge that the West has faced its model of the state. And you know the last one that we we faced was the Soviet one, which was an obvious disaster. This is a much bigger bigger enemy because it points to some of the problems with democracy, um, with uh, with an over generous welfare state, uh, and with a, a highly protected public sector, which we really have to grapple with. And this we're going to see the, the the world moving in in a in a sort of in a very different direction from a liberal direction. Can I ask a supplementary, uh, Nick? Yes, please. please. Yeah, yeah. So, um, we've had discussions about a distinction that I think a lot of people can see between uh, policy and delivery um, and a focus in the UK civil service on um, the former rather than the latter, um, or more of a focus on policy yeah. than delivery. Do you, when you look at Singapore, do you see that distinction uh, existing and how is it how does it manifest itself or you know would a would a Singaporean senior civil servant not really understand that distinction you know um, would it be so much more about results and how, how I think is... it's I think it's my impression is that, it, that that it's much more result oriented that people are measured and rewarded for their capacity to deliver a certain set of results and if they don't hit those results indeed they they, they see it in their in their pay packet and indeed their job tenure. So yeah, it's not it's not just a talking shop or a policy obsessed thing. It's mm. it's 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 a very results obsessed thing. As and in, indeed you see that that model of performance related rewards being imitated in in China. Thank you, um, Adrian. Didn't you put your your finger on it though when you talked about you know in the end the fundamental challenge to democracy? Uh, because isn't it a characterization? of the Singaporean system that it is more authoritarian. And uh, I mean, setting aside the issue of size, which George Osborne drew attention to in our first evidence session, um, is it, you know, the, you know, there, it, 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 there is frankly less democracy, isn't there? And, uh, you know, doesn't it make it easier to have more command in the, in, in the system? And aren't you really putting your finger on the problems in a mature democratic system that there is it, it, it is sometimes much harder to get things done when there are pressure groups uh, and big influences from civil society. 
I, I think that, 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 that there's truth in that, certainly a lot of truth in that, but I don't think the only reason why Singapore is successful is because it's sort of a bit more, it's, it's, it's more authoritarian than us. I think it's also successful because it does a number of things which we as democracies could also do. I think um, paying civil servants more money, sacking failed civil servants, that's, or, or teachers or whatever, it's something you can do within, within a democracy. I think having a culture of, of excellence within the public sector, uh, as well as the private sector, giving the public sector a sort of ethos of, of, of excellence is perfectly, we used to do it in this country much more, the French still do it. I think that's something that we, we, we could do without you know, importing authoritarianism. So I think a lot of what's happened that we, we, we worry about in our book to democracy is not something inherent in democracy, it's something to do with a certain sort of drift of democratic countries since the, you know, the 1960s onwards. Uh, we used to be better at doing this sort of stuff and we can be better at doing that, 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 this sort of stuff um, without sacrificing democracy. We need to be a bit more tough-minded but we need to be tough-minded tough liberals and tough-minded Democrats rather than tough-minded authoritarians. Can I, can I jump in very quickly? Just, just two, I mean, the, yes, we, I mean, again, we, we, we wouldn't idolize Singapore too much in this, but you know, there is a basic question, which, which is a hard one for people in the West to answer is, you know, is, is the Singaporean civil service, is it succeeded because it's more authoritarian or is it succeeding because it's more like our private sector? I mean, yeah. all the things, if you look at the real reasons, you get rid of the kind of slightly bullshitty things about some of the authority, you know, chewing gum and things like this. It, it, you know, the real reason is it does things that many of the private sector people on this call just do normally. Um, you know, if you, have a, if you have useless public servants, get rid of them. If you have good ones, promote them, reward them, act fast, move quickly. It, it's sort of that kind of thing. And I, and I think the I mean, one thing we, we should stress again, there's a lot of history in this book, is that yes, Singapore is doing this well. You look back through the history of our country, um, you know, the great rev the great revolutions in government were were started. You know, so many of them came from here, and that's one reason why we sort of applaud what you what you're trying to do. But in a strange way, you know, you couldn't imagine a commission like this in Singapore because it's been the sort of ethos of it for 40, 50 years. It would be they would find they would find it rather quaint, um, I, and I would not underestimate the level to which China looks at these things. Quite a long time ago, and you could test the exact date. I went to go and interview Li Kuan Yew, and I arrived when I was this when I was still editor of the Economist, and I arrived, and the um, I was told to wait a day, and the reason was because this man from China was coming, um, who had just been appointed vice I think it's vice president of the military commission, which means you become the heir to China. And Xi Jinping showed up. One of the things he first did with, I think it was in the first couple of weeks, was he shot straight to Singapore to see an ailing Lee Kuan Yew because people in China thought that was the most, you know, that was one of the things you needed to do rapidly if you were going to try and understand which way China was going. So there is a, there is a kind of set of, there, there isn't, there, what we're saying is there is a set of ideas out there. We don't agree with all of them, but they are at the moment producing, a, aiming at producing a much smaller state than we are that seems to leave the customers, to use Bill's word, better off. And that's the challenge for us. Thank you, it's incredibly uh, uh, interesting. Uh, Bill, um, would you like the last word in the last two minutes? Um, as former prime minister of a, of a country uh, that tends to pay more attention to Asia than we have uh, in the past, uh, or any, any thoughts or reflections on John and uh, Adrian's uh, evidence session, if, if not, don't worry, but I wanted to give you that opportunity. Well, I thought that discussion was fascinating. Um, having spent a bit of time with both Lee Kuan Yew and Xi Jinping myself. Uh, maybe it was you. Maybe it was you. I was being told to wait for that. <laughs> <laughs> no. um, I mean, the, the Chinese have turned out to be incredible technocrats. I mean, the reason we don't like dictatorships is because usually they end up getting it wrong. Yeah, the middle class doesn't like that, but China's managed to get it right for for quite a long time. Yeah. They'll get it wrong in the end. Um, look, I think this with this whole business of whether, you know, the, the liberal democratic, I think, approach to change in government is the one that's consistent. We're not going to go authoritarian, but it's the one that's consistent with the types of societies we want to create. And that is where you've got, um, you know, self-determining people with a sense of what collectives they belong to and support 
uh, but also their own sense of self-reliance. And I, I, I think there's a kind of coalition of the of the, the marginal and dispossessed uh, who are who who are not served by the traditional post-war welfare state that can be stitched together that will, can, can get support across the political spectrum from the the, the, sort of the centre right because of the self determination message and from the centre left because it's the it, it, it sees itself as the natural ally of the marginalised. Mm. Um, it's just that its own institutions um, are feeding off the misery, not now, where they used to try and reduce it. Uh, and, and I think that's part of a political path through, because what we have, I think, learned is that fiddling with the wiring diagram and the constitutional mechanisms uh, now just has such a small return on investment. You know, we, we've had we've had quite innovative constitutional experimentation going on in the West, uh, but it just feels like it's kind of, it's, it's, it's run its course because it's become too self-referential. And so you have a bit like how diet religions die and you've got to reach out of that and to the, what was the original and fundamental and motivating purpose, which was at the very least to protect the most vulnerable. And you just now have a you now have government that doesn't do that, and and its regulatory capacity is a threat to growth just because it create it's created so many veto points yeah. for anything you want to get done. Okay, brilliant. And I think there is a political path through it. Yeah, thank you, Bill. That's a very very good reminder of what the sort of fundamental purpose of any commission like this should uh, should be the moral dimension. Um, Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for joining us. Thank you uh, to John and Adrian too. It's been an absolutely fascinating uh, two hours. Thank you uh, on behalf of all the commissioners and uh, we will be um, putting this uh, evidence session up on our website shortly. Thank you very much, everyone. Thanks, Nick. Thank you, Thank you very Thank much you. for having us. Thank you. Thank you, Bill, as well.